We will now hear from Dr. J. Marshall Shepard, who is both a climate scientist and meteorologist. We've included links to his TED Talks and articles under the resource tab. I'd encourage you to check them out when you can. Dr. Shepard has an impressive career, so please read his bio. I'd like to note that just this year, he was elected to the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. One of these would have been a significant achievement. However, we congratulate you, Dr. Shepard, for all of these honors. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm going to take this opportunity to share my screen and thank you for those kind, kind words of introduction. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, yes. great. So I want to take the opportunity today, I, I realize the, uh, the audience that I'm speaking with is perhaps not the audience that I often speak with, but it's an audience that certainly is cognizant of the challenge of climate change, extreme weather, and connections perhaps to um, marginalized communities and so forth. And so I wanted to start with this quote by Gilbert White, who's a noted geographer, who, who said the gap between the rich and poor is growing among and within most nations. The global environment shows signs of widespread deterioration. Both natural and social environments are increasingly vulnerable to catastrophic events and disturbances. I think this is an appropriate context to begin my talk because one of the things that we've recently seen is that climate change and the associated extreme weather events have disproportionate impacts on certain communities. Uh, the graphic that you see on this slide highlights some of those communities. We know that communities of color, children, older adults, and low-income communities uh, have been identified by the National Climate Assessment Report from which this figure comes as particularly vulnerable. And as you see, if you kind of browse through some of the text on that figure, uh, there, there are health and medical implications of some of these vulnerabilities. Ad adults can lessen risk by monitoring exertion and hydration in children, for example. Children have a higher risk of heat stroke and illnesses than adults do. Uh, we know that adaptation plans that consider these communities improve access to health care, and that helps address social inequities. And of course, then there are the mental and uh, other uh, physical uh, illnesses that have come along with uh, heat waves, hurricanes, tornadoes, and so forth. Uh, there you see all of my credentials and places that you can find me. If you are on Twitter, I want you to stop right now and go follow me on Twitter at Dr. Shepherd 2013 And the reason I say that is because I like for you to engage when I give these talks. I like for you to tweet out what you hear, things that catch your ear. Uh, because oftentimes these are really great opportunities, but they're insular. They're just for the people that have registered for this event. We, we want to share this information as broadly and as widely as possible. Uh, I also host a show on the Weather Channel, a, a podcast called Weather Geeks, and I'm a senior contributor to Forbes as well. I want to start close to home for some of you. Uh, during and after uh, the recent Hurricane Ida, uh, which was an impactful storm in Louisiana and along the Gulf of Mexico. But interestingly, the storm remnants moved into parts of the Northeast and caused significant damages and health-related outcomes there as well. At least 11 people were found dead in basements after torrential rains. Uh, those of you in New York, we saw tremendous rain rates on the order of three inches of rain in one hour. That's, that was a new record for New York City and Central Park. We just haven't seen those types of rain rates in recent times. It's very consistent with what we as climate scientists would expect uh, from a warming climate system. There's an old adage which says the warmer the atmosphere, the more water vapor it can hold. Uh, it's actually a physics principle too called the clausius clapeyron relationship. But when we have a warming climate system, there's more water vapor available to these hurricanes, to these rainstorms, even to snowstorms as well, which can be counterintuitive to people that think, wait, warming climate, snowstorms, but indeed there's a relationship as well. And so we have to start with uh, this statement in the New York Times. Uh, it says, the people living in illegal basement apartments face danger. That's not new. That's been a 
uh, a danger for some time. But while the worrying has traditionally focused on fires or perhaps carbon monoxide poisoning, climate change is bringing a new reality to vulnerable communities that may be living in such homes, flooding in their own homes. And so I think this really highlights some of what I want to talk about today, which is that marginalized communities disproportionately are impacted from a weather, climate, and a perhaps a health outcome standpoint when we think about climate change. I, I used to be a scientist at NASA, and so I like to show cool visuals like this. And so uh, this just shows you, and I'll set it forward again, this shows you the water vapor associated with Hurricane Ida as Ida made landfall in the Gulf of Mexico and then uh, moved into your neck of the woods. Uh, the white shading that you see, that's water vapor. And so a uh, significant amount of water vapor. A bit closer to home, uh, we've done studies here in athens Clark County. As you can see from my shirt, I'm a professor at the University of Georgia. And in counties surrounding and inclusive of the University of Georgia, which is athens Clark County, uh, our studies show uh, that uh, black populations and poor populations are overrepresented in counties that flood more frequently. And this is something that we found around the nation. This isn't unique to athens Clark County. So let's start with the elephant in the room. Climate is changing. Uh, we know that it's uh, related to greenhouse gases more so in the last 100 years. Of course, climate changes naturally. I'm a climate scientist, so if you follow me on Twitter, you will occasionally see people tweet me and say, hey, Dr. Shepard, it's snowing today. What happened to global warming? Or hey, Dr. Shepard, I've got 20 inches of global warming in my yard. How can there be climate change? Well, that's just a statement that shows that that person doesn't understand the difference between weather and climate. Uh, I often say weather is your mood and climate is your personality. In other words, one day's weather doesn't define climate any more than your mood today tells me about your personality. So even in a climate changed world, we'll still have cold weather and we'll still have snowstorms because we'll still have winter. But nevertheless, we know that climate is changing and impacting things like sea level rise, uh, intensity of hurricanes, floods, and so forth. But this climate change also impacts people, ecosystems, and the economy. Uh, for too long, I feel like the climate change discussion was centered around polar bears and the year 2080 or the year 2100. Climate change is a here and now problem and it is affecting every aspect of our lives, including our health and public health and, and some medical related challenges. Just in 2019, I sat before the House Science Committee. That's, that's a picture of me and a couple of experts testifying before Congress. And I told them flat out, I said, look, the extremes are becoming more extreme. People notice them and feel them far more than they do averages. And so if you look at just that little graphic there in the bottom right, that's the number of 20, uh, the number of billion dollar plus weather climate disasters that we had last year in this country. Uh, I believe the new updated map for 2021 is out and it was an equal number or perhaps even more. Uh, when you consider a factor in the wildfires, the 2021 hurricane season, uh, the uh, the heat wave in, in parts of the Pacific Northwest earlier last year as well. So we know that extreme events are becoming more extreme. And so when the media, I get questions from the media all of the time. And so one of the articles that I recently wrote in Forbes magazine said three questions about climate change that just need to disappear in the year 2022. When the New York Times or the Washington Post or CNN contacts me, they just don't need to ask these questions anymore. The first one is, are we in a new normal climate? I said, yes, 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 we are. And I'll even go to, as far as to say, we need to stop referring to it as the new normal. It's our normal now. It is what it is, as the young folks say. That is our normal. It's not a new normal anymore. It is our normal, more extreme events. What do you think about this being the warmest year, or the warmest month, or the warmest winter, or the warmest summer? My answer is, that's not breaking news anymore. That's not how we need to cover climate change. I fully expect extreme temperature, extreme rainfall, hurricane intensity records to continue to be broken. That's not what we need to report anymore. We need to talk about how uh, certain populations when ci in cities are disproportionately um, uh, exposed to health outcomes related to heat. Or we need to talk about the fact that we 
we'll have increasingly more intense and wetter hurricanes. And we know that there are immediate health and medical impacts from hurricanes, but then there are residual ones because of flooding and waterborne disease and dysentery and things along of the, that nature that come along with extreme flood events. And so that's how we need to think about and talk about climate change going forward. We need to kind of get over this, oh my gosh, it's the strongest uh, hurricane we've seen. I mean, that's just, that's, that's the reality that we live in. Are we acting fast enough? Absolutely not. So when we think about health, infrastructure, and people, and extreme events, I, I frame it in terms of risk and resilience. Uh, in the, when we talk about the Hurricane Ida, for example, that's the hazard. Many people in the Gulf of Mexico and in New York were exposed to that hazard. But there are different levels of sensitivity or vulnerability to that exposure. Look, if I'm in New Orleans, and I, I live in the Atlanta area, but if I lived in New Orleans at my income level and my socioeconomic level, if I know that there's a Category 5 hurricane coming, uh, I'm probably able to pack up my family and go to Memphis or Atlanta and stay in a hotel for five days as, as I evacuate. Or I probably have solid insurance if something does happen to my home after I evacuate that I'm able to bounce back from that event. That's called resilience. And so when we think about hazard, exposure, vulnerability, and resilience in this framework, we come up with risk. And so this is how we arrive back at this graphic that I started to talk with because there are some people that have low resilience. Uh, there's a hurricane coming, they may not have the ability to leave, so they have to stay. Or they, they may be predisposed because they already have uh, higher uh, incidences of upper respiratory diseases or heart conditions and so forth because of their racial makeup. And then you exacerbate that with stressors uh, like hurricanes, extreme heat or drought. I'll give you an example of some of our research into this. This is a paper that we published from a paper that we published back in 2015. We created a vulnerability index for the state of Georgia. Now we looked at every county in the state, but we didn't just look at it from the perspective of the heat waves, floods and drought and hurricanes. We also looked at how close people live to, uh, to hospitals, uh, how much healthcare they had, adequate air conditioning and so forth. And so we created a social vulnerability index combine that with uh, tendencies and trends and extreme weather in those counties, and look what we came up with. From the 1980s to 2010s, our entire state has become more climate vulnerable. You can see that just by looking at the yellow going to orange. But then if you look more carefully, uh, you see that certain counties are even more climate vulnerable. Now, this is the metropolitan Atlanta area. This is Savannah, Chatham County. Uh, you see uh, other smaller cities like Macon and Columbus and Augusta. So clearly there's an urban county vulnerability, but we also see that Georgia's coastal communities are more vulnerable to sea level rise and hurricanes. We see that certain agricultural counties are more vulnerable down here in the southern part of our state because uh, when there's drought, they, they don't have any uh, agricultural productivity and people lose their jobs in the fields and so forth. So vulnerability is multifaceted. So what we did last year in a paper, uh, we wanted to project out what that climate risk looks like in the year 2040 or so. And so we considered the, that hazard, vulnerability, and exposure framework that I talked about. We use climate models to project out future vulnerability from the standpoint of drought, floods, and so forth. And we also projected out socioeconomic uh, vulnerability, uh, you know, economic factors, health-related factors, and so forth. And this is sort of what we came up with. This is the projected climate hazard space in the year 2040. So in other words, where you see purplish conditions, uh, those are increased heat waves, lack of cold spells, or more extreme precipitation events. And so you can kind of see places that we expect climate to cause more of those extremes. This map here is a projection of where social vulnerability, and this is the health and, and economics and social status are all wrapped up into this index. And you can see that there are places in this country that have greater social vulnerability, the desert Southwest, uh, the black belt communities of the South, uh, 
parts of Florida and even urban areas as well, like New York and Washington and so forth. These were have socially vulnerable populations. Now, when we combine those together, boom, here are the places that we feel have the greatest climate risk in the year 2040. And one of the things that you can see is that many of our urban counties light up as highly climate vulnerable. Uh, Southern Florida, parts of the Gulf Coast and the desert Southwest and parts of the Pacific Northwest. Now, this does not mean if you see yellow that these counties aren't climate vulnerable. This is a relative scale. It just means the counties that are lighting up in orangish to purple are more climate vulnerable. Everyone's climate vulnerable in some sense, but these are the counties that we project in the year 2040 based on their social vulnerability, the trends in their demographics and so forth, and where we expect certain extremes to happen with more frequency or intensity. These are the places that we feel are most climate vulnerable or at climate risk in the year 2040. So let me sort of bore into that here in the time that I have left. This, these are examples of that. This is the city of Baltimore. On the right is income. On the left is surface temperatures. You can clearly see that places that have higher income have cooler temperatures. And so the urban heat island uh, is more uh, prevalent in poor communities. That has fundamental health outcomes associated with it right? Why do cities uh, with higher income regions have cooler temperatures? Well, they're more affluent communities. They may have more trees. They may have, have less industrialized space, uh, less pavements, and so forth that will store, retain, and re-emit heat. You come closer to Atlanta and to Georgia, we found the same thing. Uh, this is a, a, a vulnerability index of heat for our state. And you can see, again, our urban counties light up, but we've looked at even more closely at this. This is some recent research from my group here at the University of Georgia. And this is daytime heat clusters in the metro Atlanta area from 2003 to 2020. So one of the things that you can clearly see, if you look here, this is our urban heat island, but look at this. Black communities are predisposed or disproportionately living in some of the hottest parts of the city. Uh, and that is likely tied to historical redlining and discriminatory practices from decades prior. And we know that that has health outcomes and medical out related outcomes as well. And here's just a look at some of the, red this is a typical redlining map from like 1931. If you're not familiar with redlining, uh, mortgage lenders and banks and so forth redlined certain communities where they didn't want to give loans or assume that they were more risky. Over time, that has created socioeconomic sort of patterns in where certain people live. And what we're finding is that those practices may be related to uh, this disproportionate exposure to heat. What worries me is that cities are warming faster. So not only do we have the greenhouse gas warming of our climate, you add that to these heat island effects or these heat islands within heat islands for certain communities, and you have uh, further uh, created a vulnerable population. One of the things that we've proposed to do, and I won't spend a good bit of time on this, is we've proposed to try to engineer cities for thermal justice. We, we have some really radical ideas about how we can change the way we engineer cities to redistribute or repurpose heat to move it out of some of those communities and, and you know provide equity in terms of heat. So we have what we call or what I call a weather climate gap. There's a disproportionate sensitivity to extreme weather climate events and a delay in the ability to bounce back. I've given you examples in the past. For example, Black Americans are more likely to live in urban heat islands. And that again has implications for health. That weather climate gap is directly tied to the racial wealth inequality. Uh, look at the difference in um, median household wealth for white, black, Latino families. And if you look at this, you can clearly understand and start to derive an understanding of health disparities that emerge uh, as related to heat waves and hurricanes and insurance availability and so forth. It's not, I, I used to work at not NASA, but this is not rocket science. Clearly, uh, this uh, health uh, uh, wealth disparity is driving the extreme weather climate gap disparity. 
Uh, unfortunately, many vulnerable populations live in places that are particularly prone to climate disasters. This, um, 55 percent of African Americans live in the southern United States or live in cities, and these areas are predisposed to, uh, to uh, facing extreme weather climate events. This is a headline in the Houston Chronicle that said a year after Hurricane Harvey in 2017, Houston's poorest neighborhoods were slowest to recover. And that means from an economic standpoint, from a health standpoint and otherwise. Likewise with Hurricane Katrina in 2005. 2005, but let, look at this headline. White New Orleans has recovered from Hurricane Katrina. Black New Orleans hasn't. That was written in 2016. 11 years after Hurricane Katrina, uh, vulnerable communities in New Orleans still haven't recovered, and yet they just got pounded in the last two years, 2020 and 2021, by two of the most active hurricane seasons on record. Um, we've done some research here at the University of Georgia and found that African American and other poor communities and marginalized communities are 44% more likely to reside in areas that flood. And in the Greenville, Spartanburg, South Carolina, uh, African-Americans are 80% more likely to reside in 500-year flood zones. Again, you can make the connections to the economic infrastructure and health-related challenges associated with statistics and data like that. So I want to draw to a close here by, you know, basically reciting something that my good friend and colleague and mentor, Dr. Robert Bullard, who is considered by many the father or godfather or grandfather of the environmental justice movement. He says, environmental justice embraces the principle that all people and communities have a right to equal protection and equal enforcement of environmental laws and regulations. Today, zip code is still the most potent predictor of an individual's health and well-being. Individuals who physically live on the wrong side of the tracks are subjected to elevated environmental health threats and more than their fair share of preventable diseases. And what he's talking about with environmental justice is this idea that certain uh, companies and industries and factories and landfills are disproportionately placed in poor communities based on zip code. But what I've established here in the talk today is that we can take that environmental justice and move it into a climate justice framework as well. Because it's not just that there are factories and polluting sources in these communities, these communities now are also disproportionately affected by hurricanes, heat waves, flood, drought, and wildfires and so forth as well. It's not just climate. Uh, uh, there's a, some analysis that shows that Doppler radar coverage in this country, uh, there may be gaps in the South where a, a large, uh, fraction of, of poor and, and communities of color live. So if there's a tornado coming and it's in this gap not seen by radars, are these people disproportionately vulnerable? So to close, how do we really close this weather climate gap that I've talked about? We've got to reduce emissions and increase adaptation. We've got to reduce greenhouse gases. We've got to tackle the climate change problem at its core, reaching those Paris Agreement uh, targets of keeping us below 1.5 degree of warming. We've got to erode that income gap. I mean, until we erode that income gap, we're going to see the weather and climate gap. But we have to make sure that mitigation and other policies aren't selectively benefiting a few and on the backs of others. And we have to continue to educate marginal populations about their vulnerabilities as well. Uh, there is optimism. Science is respected again. Uh, there's climate across all agencies. You know, I advise the, our federal government on these issues all the time. And one of the things that I'm seeing that's a bit different now is you used to just have climate discussion in places like NASA, National Weather Service, Department of Energy, or EPA. But now there's climate policy and discussion in health and human services, in DOT, in housing and urban development, in those agencies that you may not necessarily identify as being up thinking about climate. And so that's something that I noticed that's different. The United States is back in the Paris Agreement. Uh, I don't know whether we'll get a, pre a Green New Deal. I'm not here to advocate for or against it. But one of the things that I will point out is that discussion is talking not just about renewable energy and so forth. It's talking about equity and justice issues as well. And so uh, I, I'm going to end there. I, I did want to note a shameless plug for a book that I wrote last year on the sort of racial challenges that we are facing in this country. 
And the reason it's relevant is many of these equity and justice issues that I've talked about uh, kind of have their roots in some of the other broader societal issues that we're facing as it involves race, class, and, and, and economics as well. So I put down some thoughts after George Floyd last year, and I'm happy to share those with you there. That book's available on Amazon. Thank you so much.